was just, I was reading about this part where it says the professionals and the experts um, typically fight the media addiction with the commodified media itself. Yeah. Meaning blogs and social media right. accounts. And this is why, this is why, why we don't, we launched a blog a year ago yeah. and we don't use it anymore because we think it's to fight the devil with the devil. Well, you have a website. And you're sitting there. You're sitting there looking, and you're looking at how many people are signing up to your. But that's. But it's that's. Be five minutes since you've been here. No, that's not true. I checked three times in two days. You've got four different accounts to mediate this the communication. No, but that's. But that's different. What I'm talking about. This is talking about you're it, using commodified media content to fight the addiction, which is we don't do that. We don't play into that game because, because, like what Ariane Huffington and the rest of the industry does, like. Like, read this top 10 ways, read this article, read why tech addiction, oh, okay. read, like, the commodified content. By her posting, and the, they'll have an entire industry of experts posting more information. Yes. People who then say, oh, I agree, or I'm interested, end up spending more time online, and end up wasting yeah. more time, they fall into more addiction. But I was saying that we don't do that. Like, this company retreat we just had, we took a stand that says, that's why we don't, if you look, we have a campground group and a, a Facebook group, but we don't publish any information. We don't push out any so any it's all about The only therapy you provide it has to be experience. Experience in, in the living being togetherness. Experience, or if it's something that we're giving people to read, it's something that we give people to read and talk about in person with each in other. Moment. Like that's why we're we're gonna put out zines and material stuff so people can talk about and share. But we don't want to create things that put people back into the medium mm. because that's what's wrong with the movement is that it's 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 uh, hypocritical. But you're still promoting. No, but but no, that's not because we're doing ticket sales. We're doing we're doing event sales. We're we're getting people to be able to to commit to coming to something, experience something uh -huh. through a transaction that takes less than two minutes. Yes. And we're not saying share this on Facebook. We're not telling them to post their their shit that they bought a ticket. I'm on a digital detox. Is a little is a little um, face. Oh. Twitter replacement thing that you wanted people to say. I'm on a right. Well, you make stuff. Well, for and, that or promotional material well, that you want people to utilize on their social media. No, we t we tell people to make their own, but if they don't, they sh they can use one of ours just so when they don't get bombarded while they're offline. Because if you don't set up that you're leaving, you're going to come back with more messages than you than you can deal with. But and it also works for promotional. I mean. Material. It's true, you know that's true. It's I don't think it's but a that's huge not, problematic contradiction. No, but that's right. not a contradiction. And the ticket sales I don't find is a contradiction. It's not too bad. That's using a technology for its for for good. Right. Otherwise you're using it as a tool. Otherwise we wouldn't get people to be able to commit from around the country to But what about that thing country. you told me last night in which you said you will at the next company retreat you're gonna say we have to take a stand on trying to get off of Well we're gonna get we're gonna not have anything on these social media sites. Right. right now, we're not we're not propagating them with, with content. Is what this article is saying. But you're going to say you're going to get off. You're not going to have a website. No, I didn't say we're going to have a website. Okay. I, there's nothing wrong with having a website. There's nothing wrong with having if your if your platform or your data or your information that you're putting on the world is inherently made to give people the opportunity to engage and get off, or to take information or to sign up and get offline. That's not a problem. But the problem is when products and platforms are created to suck people's time and energy. So what did you say last night about saying you're going to say? I would say get off of, get off, us get off of Facebook and get off of social media. and but get not, off. But not the internet. No, the internet. Is Have a website, but don't use social media is what you plan to move the corporation to that direction. Well, I, I, I would say use platforms and products that are inherently designed to, to basically use them as a tool and not as a time suck, product driving, commodifying, time fuck. Yeah, totally. Okay. Anyway, I was, I, was saying, I was saying that what this person's saying is right and we don't fall into that trap. Yeah, okay, good. But it's nice to point that out because everyone else is, is, is masturbating their, their exactly. blog pages so people spend more time reading about content. I know, I know. Exactly, exactly. When do we have to leave by? So finish the blog. This is not interesting. You don't think? No. Keep reading.
Yeah, this, I mean, I agree with all this. Addict to social media, read this blog to find out how. Have a problem, buy this book to cure it. Like, right. I agree with this. That's why it. I don't follow Keep this. Going. Keep going. Keep going. I also think this is skewing information too. This is what? The getting stuff done yeah. and productive. I think most people who talk about that that I know talk about getting stuff done in their social life. Like doing the things that they want to do, not being productive in the work world. Like people talk about being more productive in their... What's her quote? She's, I mean, she's talking about being more productive mm. in corporations and media. Okay. And I think, yes, some people say that, but to blanket it, that's saying all this media refusal improves productivity, which then makes more work, is false because most of the time people are really using Facebook, it's during social downtime at at large, and, it, and so people aren't going out and hanging out with friends. They're actually making art, or making playing music, or mm -hmm. going on hikes. They're being lazy, and they're watching TV on their computers. Yeah. Anyway, that's a good point. That's really I, I just I'm not a fan of how a lot of this stuff just takes the extreme just to take the extreme. <sighs> what? Well, I mean, somebody has to mount a critique because all the other journalism has been one thing, but Al Alexis Madrigal's fucking piece, which wasn't that great. Either. Alexis Madrigal is an idiot. No, he's not. At least somebody was trying to say, hey, let's look at, let's look at... I think just magical talks, talks shit about me and a bunch of people, but has no idea what grounds he's talking about. And he hasn't actually experienced or talked That's or spoken true. to any of us. A true journalist and a true anthropologist would come and talk to people who are involved in it instead of, instead of basing their critiques off of a, a travel and leisure article. You're absolutely right. Completely. I invite Alexis Magical to come to camp. You did? I'll fucking put a pie in his face. Put that in your fucking article. Not this third one. Third one's not good. But you didn't highlight anything really. It's not third one, so it's not I don't know. I, I it's fine. But I don't think it's very interesting. True. Nice. But I have, I have I have mutual friends with Alex 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 yes, we all, Madrigal. We all and people just say he's bitter and and uh, like his critique on Camp Grounded and stuff is just based off of bullshit that he's doing. Okay, well you get work. I'm gonna camera these pants or you can sure. get trash. Fine. I'm asking. Yes, you can. You can. You can. You can. You can get trash. No, no, definitely I can get trash. Alright, I'm gonna put a thermal on a shirt and I'll bring what are these things? You, what do you have for another pair of pants in case? I'll bring, I can bring another pants. Bring another pair of pants. The book's too long.
take my fucking uh, to my train ride? Yeah, they should. I'll last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Seven. Seventy-five. Seventy-five pounds. Absolutely, I will. I'll talk to. Uh, I'll talk to my I mean, I don't have to come out here. No, no, no. I need to almost certainly that. That will be done. I should have. I like teaching it, don't get me. I like talking to Chinese people. I hope that is on the record. Oh shit. That's on the record. Siri, text this message to Alex Madrigal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's so it's not that we're against it. It's but we use it, and then we print it out, and then we have it. And I yeah. when the yeah. old phones were ESR, yeah. um, so. when you said print out, that's what I thought. Because we've done that for a few years. Absolutely. So, who has a burning question for Mr. Felix here? <laughs> who wants to begin by posing a query here for Adrian? I'm not Adrian, sorry, my god, I've done it again! Oh my god, somebody help me. Uh, so, anybody? I could call on somebody, but anybody have anything? Daphne? Cher? Anybody? That's a fantastic, that's yeah, that's a great practice to do. So why don't we work in groups and just like have a conversation about some of the issues and maybe that will drum up some concerns that you have and then you'll be uh, more confident about uh, airing those, those, those queries out to us. Lord knows I've got some. <laughs> Damn. Damn. <laughs> Only three days with you, it's not Love enough it. to try to... Try to pop this bubble of optimism. <laughs> it's not. I'm not quite cynical. You know that. I'm actually quite cynical about those situations. Here you go. I got you a better one. Yeah. Better whiskey. Better. God, yeah. that biker is great. Isn't it? Yeah, I want some sushi. Now. Sushi. Not in this town. Not in this town. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. It's, 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 that's right. That's right. No. That's right. That's right. Now we're going straight to the tap house. And then on to the other. Have you been to the tap house yet? Is that pub on the back street? That, that's right. Yeah. Kind of near the, between the borough and the, that kind of walking street. It's all about boutique beer. It's very, very clean, well done. They don't like children in there. The music can be a little difficult, but it's, uh, it's not your typical uh, spot. The sun, yeah, I like that. That's nice too. I think Burrow is actually better for you. I think that's that that kind of cozy environment. You'd like to get a sense of that English environment. I want to go to like a, a what is it called? A peanut place where they where they throw peanuts on the ground? Peanut shells? Yeah. They sh in London, they had this, here. these people I was with London, they were like, they were telling me that they had a word, a, a name, a slang for it. They said these used to be this kind of pub, but now they're taking over with red bricks and Edison bulbs, and they're all hipstered out. Like yeah, well, show. well, my advice yeah. would be to try and get to a country yeah. pub in London. Yeah. That's yeah. one that's yeah. like seventeenth century. Oh, yeah. 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 It's yeah, yeah. It's really small yeah. and enclosed. Yeah. yeah. And incredibly yeah. cozy and yeah. Yeah. with a landscape yeah. around it. Yeah, yeah. Kendall. Yeah. Up in that area. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We're heading out. Up the Lynn Valley. Yeah. The Halton, those in Halton aren't that, they're quite, have that mystique. Yeah. And Caton, Caton even. Oh, no, you lived in Caton. Yeah. Right. Cleaned up too much. The ship. Yeah, the ship is the one. Yes, it's cleaned up a bit too much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Condo Green. It's heading in a bit different direction. It's heading out towards. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, yeah. I know that one. That one is cool. Yes. That's classic. Yeah. Water witch. That's right. That's right. It is. Yeah. I met a guy who found a wounded swan out there and then strangled it and gutted it and ate it, which is a, which is a federal offense here. They're protected by the queen. Those big beautiful swan. He said there isn't a lot of meat on it. 
That's the guy who gives me the pheasants. I've got this guy that brings me pheasants. He shoots out in the fields out here. <laughs> I've got to clean them, though, which is pretty awesome. It brings me back. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a part of my digital detox, yeah. getting right back to making bread. <laughs> Absolutely. Spearfish. Oh, this is, this is part of the class. This is good. Yeah, it's good. Did you record my talk? I didn't get oh. it. I you left the phone. I've been I've been trying to uh, live by the word, the holy word, while you're here. You know. I've never. I wish I really I would have realized there's markers on the drawing and stuff. Yes. Yeah. I would have. <laughs> you just, you just line like line like circle 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 bold strokes. Yeah, bold strokes. <laughs> uh, this is how I've been teaching my little two-year-old to draw, right? Lines, circles, but then don't forget the crazy bold stroke. So the mantra is line, 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 circle, 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 bold stroke, bold stroke. Don't lose that craziness. I'm going to steal that. That's a good one. So my kid's name will be Io. Well, and that's right. So she's learning to write her name. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I don't. I mean, now I've heard your this your monologue so well, and I've known you for so long, and I've seen like his desktop, like Co it Coscast, his, his, his desktop at, on his computer, the most active, insane desktop ever. My desktop, but I'm, it is. But in a way, the way that you are pitching this, you're almost normalizing the pathology, right? Because I I look at the, some of the students we've been engaging with for the last few days, and they're kind of like, I think the younger students are like, yeah, I totally am with you, man. But I think some other students are like, I'm not really that bad. I'm, you know? I'm watching them. They're like, they're talking about the sense. <laughs> okay. No, the, it, well, also, it's, it's more, it's connected to media, not to work. Like people who consume media, people who, or have, who are connected to friends yeah. have the issues. It doesn't really connect with what work you're in. I know a lot of technologists at Facebook and Twitter and Google who don't use any of the platforms and don't have, a tr who don't have trouble leaving at night and trying it off and going home. But it's how we connect as humans to, to information and social that causes the... I think it's hard to differentiate the, the play from the work, from the on, from the well, off, in any of these, any of these but industries. I, but I have quite a few friends and that's why I still think that Camp Grounded is work. And we have a serious yeah, yeah, yeah. disagreement on that. I think that's part of the instrumental emotional labor yeah. that people ha have to do, even though it's not networking, no names, not supposed to talk about work, only supposed to be psychedelic and run around naked and, and bake bread. And that's all fantastic, but that is still a kind of really deep personal labor that they're learning to do, that they take back to work. What do you work. think of the uptake in mindfulness in the yeah. game of popularity in mindfulness? I think the government or as a kind of I think that that's great. Well, if it's actually a mind class. So it's Ariana Huffington. Yeah. She's, really yeah. she's full of shit. <laughs> she's full of shit. It's not authentic practice. Ariana Huffington, I have her email address. Don't, don't call me on this. I, not yet. But I have Ariana's email. She's emailed me directly. And her sister and her team. And they've been asking me to blog. And, but I don't really want to get into it. And Anyway, she's a fan. And she goes up in front of 6,000 people at a conference and gives a talk about this kind of thing. But, um, but more of just, just very basic. And then she says, and if you care, if you... If you have any questions or you care and we want to connect, email me at ariana at the huffingpost.com. It's not her email. That's not the one she checks. That's one that her assistant checks. So just by doing this, she's creating a fallacy to say, I'm available to you and I, I we can connect and then I actually check my emails. So she's creating this just undermining conversation that to tell people like, yeah, you should check all the email you get and, and it's bullshit. I know she doesn't check any of them. And I also know because I have friends who work for her, that she emails at 3 in the morning, and she sends emails at 5 in the morning, and she sends demands. This needs to be done immediately. And when she says, it's all about sleep, and it's all about mindfulness, that's bullshit, because I know my friend is the vice president of the Soviets, and that I know that she's... Right. Uh, she's not living what she's saying. So, but even if she's not doing that, people start practicing mindfulness and start breathing and start thinking about maybe their family or their diets, and then it's 
Mm -hmm. But the, com the, com the commodification of mindfulness mm -hmm. yeah. and the meta like, we're going to sell you this app or this headband or sell you this thing or that, that teaches you how to meditate and then you can be get better at meditating and that'll help you be a better employee and you can you can use a wearable to mine your or to track your data path of if you're being a more compassionate or like well, if you're well, it's not, I mean, not yet but there is there will be but they I mean, no but there, there will be wearable for, for, for attention and meditation and, yeah. and so then it's like but the moment you, you start thinking about am I getting better meditation you're not meditating the moment you're in your meditation you're like I'm meditating you're then yeah. I mean you, any, any monk would tell you that that's not meditation because you're achieving something your meditation is not even the void it's just the acceptance and the non-attachment to everything and so I think I think what the negative implications of all that is people then start gamifying and you know, commodifying and then all of a sudden you have another crutch I can only be mindful if I have this thing I mean I don't know I think it's a lot of it's really bogus and it's just the people the same people who co-opted everything else are now co-opting mindfulness and yoga and meditation right right yes right and so the pop, you know, I mean, Zizek says this thing about, very critical about, like, Tibetan Buddhist meditation and saying it's really the perfect kind of technology of the self for a capitalist because it enables them to kind of ameliorate the guilt and the self-consciousness, well, yeah, this in, you know, through meditation practice so they can go back to their labor and continue to do the immoral, unethical work that the whole system requires, right? But that's why it's... it's that's why the, the meditation I think is better though is the is a compassion meditation, yeah, an awareness meditation, meditation. Yeah, yeah. not yeah. a not a not a uh, disconnection and. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's good. Yeah. Yes. I heard a monk speak in London. He said it's it's more about it's, he said it's more about the compassionate meditation and the humanity. The yeah, the focus. The other one's very. Lends yeah, itself to cognitive focus. Focus, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Cogn it's, it's focusing, it's attention. So are we having a really good discussion? I hope. Absolutely. <laughs> good. Shall we, shall we begin? Good. I'm glad everybody had a good dialogue. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I know I have a million questions that I'd like to pose to him, but I'd love to hear what you guys have. Anybody? Um, Becky? <coughs> question so I think so let's start with the doctor and the nurse you know the doctor the nurse the firefighter these few these few jobs you're saving lives by being on call you know, you're choosing a career path where you're giving up some of your freedom in order to save people's lives um, my father was a physician my father was a surgeon he was on call since 1975 or something the first person with a pager and and the phone, and, and I'm seeing now the negative implications. My father is 70, he just retired, and he can't sit still. He can't retire, he has to keep himself busy with so much. Every moment he's on his phone. Um, so I think for those individuals, it's navigating the space of work, and then the, so the other things that call us, the social media, the headlines, the, the media grabbing, the, you know, I see so many professionals on the tube playing, uh, when I was in London, playing the, these candy crusher, these stupid games. So I think those are where you can kind of make the choice. Um, I think the privilege of unplugging like I had and the privilege other people have of unplugging from the world and traveling. Um, I mean, you, I went on a bike ride with Adam. We bike ride for an hour maybe. That was great. You know, finding ways in your day where you can, where you, you're not going to be on your phone. You know, where you, if you're playing sport, if you're making music, if you're making art, if you're making love, if you're making food, all of these things that in humans we handily do and have to do to stay healthy, those you can just decide that you don't do with the phone. So and you can you can then choose what your career looks like. I I've had many journalists come to my camps and my retreats and then quit their jobs because they realize I don't want to be always on Twitter the first person to write the article because like why? You know, all the articles that are coming out are all the same anyways, and they're not in depth. And he's, my friend is now writing a book about this this issue. I mean, he's already, my, bud, my buddy's writing a book about kind of this whole conversation of of depth versus first quick quick to reply. Um, so I think you can find the space in your daily life, um, and then 
and then it's a bigger question of, of society and the cultural norms of like, and also the language, instant message. Um, what are the other things? Like, there's the, all the language which is defining or the way we use our devices makes us available. Um, and, and, and the way we answer to our friends, if, if we are always the person who answers immediate emails quickly and always texts back and forth, then we're setting our own norms. But if you're the kind of, like, we all, I have friends who just don't reply to emails and they reply to a phone call or they don't respond to text messages or some don't respond to Facebook messages. And if that's the norm that you set for yourself and we kind of set as a cultural norm, then it changes how available we are, always are. And then the bigger question is defining happiness and defining how much money we need to make and how big we need to grow our companies and how, when is enough enough? You know, because I know a lot of people are super happy who, who just said, okay, I'm going to be a, a high school teacher and I, I don't need to be online all the time and I don't need to be always available and I can choose a career path that is maybe not more simple but more in line with my ethos and my philosophy. You know, so it's the greed and the financial and the ego and all of these things, like how to, how to balance those so that we're, we, feel, we feel fulfilled. So I don't know. I think there was more to, the, was there to more? this question. I mean, I think she was really trying to get you to talk about the, the, the kind of wealth and income inequality that, right, and the privilege of certain people, the privilege that certain people have to be able to even use media or to be able to detox media. Is in, that what you're in, asking? A, in a world yeah, of I austerity mean, and high right. unemployment and desperation, well, I right? Well, I I think mean, people have to try to get jobs, and they're desperate for it, and they have to be on call all the time, or they're going to lose their house, not pay for their mortgage, not pay for I food. think that's an exaggeration. No, I mean, I think, I think the, the idea of, like, there's plenty of jobs out there, and there's plenty of people in the workspace who don't need to be on call all the time. And then there's the people, like my neighbor in Oakland, who has five kids, who is now finding herself like babysitting her family with, with social media and devices. Um, and she doesn't have the privilege to go get away from it all, to go and plug. Right. Um, and also her livelihood isn't dependent on her being available online on screens. You know, um, I think the idea of the livelihood being dependent on the being available in the email and the phone, I think, look at, show me all the careers that you have to be available 24-7 and it matters how much media you consume. Show me how many careers, how many real income, it really matters. I would, I would say, show me that and I would say, look, it defeats your argument. The other part of it, the other part of it of saying though, um, kind of the economic privilege of, of from a, some of these unique perspective points is I don't have the answer for a firefighter, a doctor, or these people who have to be a politician who have to be available because that's their out. Um, you know, but also doctors who are on call all the time are making a significant amount of income, and the resources they're bringing in, you know, might validate their necessity or their 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 personal validation in life. Like my father. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you want to elaborate upon what a zero contract answer? worker is? Is um, it's like so you don't have a certain number of hours you work. What kind of work? Uh, anything like uh, working in a shop or working in a call centre or anything that used to be a normal job now isn't a normal job. Okay. Um, I mean, e even for this, those people can be available with their phone, but they don't have to check Facebook and Twitter and all the other things all the time. You know, mm. I think that's the difference is you could have this thing on you all the time. You could even set a ringer for a different type of phone call. So if it was the if it was friends and family or if it was the internet telling you that there's a new post, it could beep or buzz in a certain way. This, we have smart tools. And if it was a call center or someone who had to get a hold of you, it could beep or buzz or ring in a different way. You know, and so then you would know when it's an urgent thing to pull out. I mean, there's, I mean that's, for me, a technological fix. You can use the tool to, to solve that problem. I mean, what I talk about most of the time, stuck of the world, isn't even isn't work-related. It's social. You know, and... This is an interesting thing to point out is Volkswagen, um, there's a few big companies, but Volkswagen is the one I know that offhand, that shuts their email servers off at 6 p.m. and they turn them back on at 6 a.m. every morning yeah. because they don't want their workers to, to work after hours because they found they're more effective when they take time to go home at night. You know, so that says something about the corporations and the company start. And I think that's going to, in the next year, we're going to see that in all the major companies, whether they're tech-related or not, because people... I think so. Not in America. Probably not in America because we don't take holiday. Mm -hmm. The average American leaves seven days of holiday 
untaken every year. We don't paid holiday. Yeah. They we don't take a paid holiday because we're afraid if we don't take paid holiday, if we take paid holiday, someone else will work harder and they'll take our jobs. Mm -hmm. Our country's so dumb. Mm -hmm. Well, and to your defense about this question regarding class and access to media refusal, I think that your the campground is remarkably inexpensive, actually. And I've been watching you for the last few days. They're, they're rolling out a new, a new camp right now, and I'm watching you negotiate, um, like trying to get the price down for certain people, give people discounts. It's only like, what, 400 pounds, $400, which so, would be like... So camp is four days, nine meals, and like proper meals, like meals you would pay 15 pounds for. You know, we do... Organic chicken, sustainable meats, all all the food comes within 150 miles of where we where we serve it. So it's, you know, trying to live within our ethos, and all the programming and everything included for yeah, uh, 395 or 445 dollars. So that's like 285 pounds, 300 pounds for four days, all inclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, no conference, no camp. Festivals are a little below that, but you have to pay for food and travel. So my goal was to keep it super inexpensive so it wasn't just tech elite who come. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's any cheaper we, would, we couldn't do it. Yeah. But this has been a big thing for me is the how, to, how to create this experience so everyone can apply. Now we have scholarships, and yeah, I, I had the calculator up because I was trying to figure out how much I can give this girl off so she can mm -hmm. come. Like, what's well, my minimum that I can ha have her come. And then, so on the other side of that, we work with corporations to make money. It's kind of like the Robin Hood almost. Like, we work with corporations and teach them mindfulness and teach them how to play. And we take Yelp um, or the, these companies out for a, a workshop. And then we take their money, and that's how we're able to, in many ways, subsidize our other programming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, it's the kind of event that you could see um, individuals paying three, four thousand dollars a piece to oh, yeah. do this kind of event. You were telling me yes last night about the uh, CEO of Google, former CEO, Chairman Eric Schmidt's camp that he does. Yeah, Can you I mean, compare that to what Camp Grounded is? I mean, Eric Schmidt's camp is actually, I think, free, but it's invite only. Oh, it's okay. only for the it's only for the tech event. Right. But Summit Series, which is another event, they charge for four days. Um, similar program, they charge. Like thirty five hundred dollars, mm -hmm. they've charged two, two thousand quid. Mm -hmm. um, there's another program that's three days that has all the programming, and they don't give you accommodation, and they charge eight hundred quid. And there's another program that doesn't have sustainable food. They f serve you the war like, they serve you, the same food they serve to little kids at summer camp. So it's like whatever comes in the big trucks. It's awful food, and they charge uh, what would be like six hundred quid, five hundred quid, and so. So yeah, I mean, and these people are trying to make money and build businesses based on the vulnerability of humans feeling lonely and feeling, and us, we, like, yeah, it's not a money maker. It's, if anything, <laughs> you know, it's, I could sell out real quick, but it's not why we're doing it. That's right. Thanks for recognizing that. <laughs> you have follow-up, perhaps? Any other thing? Not on my Okay. And it's, it's a great question, because I, I say at the beginning of the speech at camp, and I play the Adam, like I say, it's a great privilege that we can all come here and unplug, because fire, I say this in the speech, because firefighters and new mothers and all these people can't unplug. Like, let's all take a deep breath and appreciate that we're able to be here and that we have the money, the resources to come to camp, you know, and not put towards, you know, our child or put towards something. Like, that's a huge privilege. But I don't, think, I don't think someone needs to come to a camp or retreat to have that, you know. You can, Go on a bike. <gasps> you can go on a bike ride. It's going to be about my kids. So Thank I you. Do, I do need to check that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, let's hear from others. Other questions? You too. You too. Uh, I just want to ask again about like, um, uh, what do you think about like kind of the uh, good way to, you know, really regulate but make kind of some ethics on it? Because my country, they actually have build a law yeah. and they're playing the game for like they regulated playing the game for under nineteen. Like after ten they cannot play the game because it's legally illegal. You, if if you after ten if you're still playing, you're not really going to the jail but you know, you like disconnected by the companies. 
So we have some kind of a case for obviously, obviously like using a lot for the uh, computer Where are you media from? stuff. Where are you uh, from? from South Korea. Okay. Yeah. So well. So what might you say? Well, like which way you're gonna choose for? South Korea is having like South Korea is. I think in South Korea, in many ways, is showing kind of the future of tech addiction and all this. Because there's boot camps for kids, and there's huge regulations, and there's major issues with people not talking to other people for hours or days at times and getting sucked into their kind of video, more video gaming, yeah, right. and also these smaller social interactions, and also dating, like people mm -hmm, yeah. date. You can almost date like avatars or date non like, mm -hmm. pseudo-humans and... I don't know. I don't have. I don't know. I think on a per, on a personal level or for a government. What was the question exactly? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if maybe if the government asking to like, you know, if you have a, if you have a power to say okay, people might have to follow kind of this way to mm -hmm. stop using not really stop but like you know, just like regulate. Maybe I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's scary when the government. It's it's scary when the government starts regulating things mm -hmm. like that, right? Like, it's scary when the government can regulate yeah. anything we do as humans. Um, that, yeah, you know, I was in countries that didn't allow Facebook. Mm. And I got on, I used the, you know, a system to get on Facebook. And, um, you know, I think censorship or anything like that is dangerous. I think it's when, I think the most, I think regulation should come into play when you're putting when you're actually putting someone else's life in danger, um, or when you're putting, so if you're putting, you're putting someone else's life in danger, or you're putting like someone who's not old enough to understand the implications of something, so maybe for kids. Mm -hmm. um, I think for adults, it's very dangerous until, you know, until we know exactly what addiction looks like, what tech addiction. Um, because addiction, if someone's just addicted to their phones, and addicted to their computers, and playing video games all the time, and they're not harming anyone, and they're just becoming this thing, and they're, they're not reaping off of government subsidies, and they're not reaping off of health code. I mean, fine, like, maybe let them do that. Um, but if that's harming someone, then we need some sort of regulation. Hmm. So, you know, if you have, so I'd be, I think maybe if there's kids, and they're playing video games under the age of 16 or 18 all night, and their parents aren't regulating, and this kid isn't doing well in school, and it's, it's in many ways like an adult giving their kid, um, like in the States, there's now kids who have obesity, or like, or like who have diabetes, at like five, six, seven years old, and I think those parents should have to go to court. You know, when a three or four year old is morbidly obese and is being fed, you know, abundance of, of and they've now done some highlights in the media in the U.S. about this. It's like, I think there should be something that happens in that situation, which could be compared, like, the food you're providing for your children is kind of like the information media you're providing mm -hmm. for your kids. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, yeah, I think it's a fine line. I don't have the answer. So no regulation. You would, you would regulate, <laughs> I didn't you, you would regulate against texting while driving, but what else, what <coughs> I, else Okay, I, I haven't thought too much about regulating. I mean, I would regulate texting and driving. I would regulate biking and texting, biking and... Who does that? Shoot. <laughs> People, all, people, people in San Francisco, or even on the phone, I would say no phone yeah. calls and, tech, and on the bike. I would say for kids under a certain age, like minimal media consumption or light consumption. What about regulating the companies themselves, forcing the hands of Google and Facebook to create these frictions or these non-friction yeah, that, platforms that yeah, I get think, people off? I think, I think, I think that, I mean, I think that government could regulate what people are informed about. So maybe government doesn't regulate Facebook's how the Facebook feed works, but government would, regu would, would force Facebook to inform its users what the implications of its, of its platform or media is. Just like privacy, like here's what we're actually doing with your data. Here's what we're actually doing with the privacy. Maybe also here's the implication of spending 10 hours a day on a screen. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, we know that the average Facebook user checks this many times and people who are more likely to come on in the morning are more likely to also check more frequently. You know, like if their data and their use was revealed, I think, I mean, it's really, I think ethics, I think when, I think when companies are, are, are utilizing uh, negative or are, are 
I think when companies are, are leveraging um, inherent human qualities that make us addicted to products, they should, they should be forced to tell us. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if we, they should be forced to change, but I think we'll be better inclined as, a as people to, to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 do, I would like to see, I talk about nutrition labels, like I would like to see there be some kind of nutritional label on Facebook to say like, you know, before you go to log in, it's like people who use Facebook for more than six hours a day are more likely to be depressed than people who don't. You know, I'd love there to be, like, the cigarette cases. I'd love there to say, by pressing like on this button, you're going to waste 40, 45 minutes of your afternoon because you're, or by watching this video, I said this yesterday, I love this. when you're about to watch this video, you go to click watch, and then it says, 600 of your friends have watched this video. <clears throat> Only 10 of them made it past the first 10 seconds, or made it past the first minute. 60 of them shared it without even finishing watching it. And the average person wasted 30 minutes of their life because they watched it, posted it, other people shared it, liked it, they went back to Facebook. And even though they only came back for that one moment, you know, we all know that the moment you open Facebook or, or something, it's not just that one post, but then you, you get stuck. And so you could, you could have data around how just by, being com by coming back for a, for a notification, that that notification on average costs someone to spend. And I think time is a very, a very interesting way to say, like, you know, if you're the if the average person is going to live to be 50, 60, 120 years old, whatever, you could say the average person who watches watches this kind of video will waste 15 years of their life watching <laughs> stuff on Facebook. I mean, you could easily uh, there was an article I read the other day that said based on the average human Facebook and social media use, people are going to be spending it was like eight years or 12 years of their life looking at cat videos and reading news updates. So I think anyway, I think that could be an interesting regulation. Um, yeah. I think there should be regulation on game on games on addicting games that that don't provide anything really, and I think on casino things that you pay for that cost you money. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very. I'm. This is the conversation I'm just starting to get in with yeah. my friends yeah. about philosophy and ethics for companies. Mm -hmm. um, and really, your your hope is that some of these these corporate lackeys and executives and designers and coders that come to Camp Grounded then develop this kind of ethics through these, these experiential, immersive, you know, spaces that you create, and then it, it creates that kind of embodied ethicality that they bring back into their, their working environment. I mean... Yeah, I mean, it's like, well, in many ways, it's like, you know, the, I guess, like, lead, bu lead buildings, le you know, the environmental buildings. Oh, yeah, right, right. Like, lead certified building, I don't know if I have a third. It's like Passive House. Like, like when, a, when a house or a building gets certified as eco-friendly, mm -hmm. or... or food is organic, like, I would love to see tech companies get certified or not get certified as being ethical or organic or good for you, because then it would be up to the, the human to say, oh, I, I, would, I, like, like, I like this company, not this company. In America, there's Uber and there's Lyft, and right now we're seeing on the web people are hating on Uber because they're not a human company. They have made huge claims against people, and there's been some, so I think... I, so I, yeah, so when people come to camp or experience retreats or go to something like it, hopefully they're inspired to think more about people and less about clicks and views and ROI, you know, return on investment in dollars. Because if we treat each other like products and if we treat each other as a quantified number, you know, like I had 30,000 clicks this month and views, and if we start thinking about people as numbers and then dollar signs, I mean, that's like, that sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, it's unfortunate that most of the tech companies and that develop all the platforms that we use are all located in a very techno libertarian area in Silicon Valley, as opposed to a, a place like Scandinavia, which might be more uh, uh, welcoming for these kind of regulations. Yeah, and health things. we should. Well, Candy Crush comes from Sweden. Oh, <laughs> very yeah, Zynga, yeah, a lot of Zynga products oh. games come from those kind of spaces. That's true. You're right. But they're all—they look it's nice. Good. They always look nice. Yeah. I mean, like based on what you said, like what do you think the role of the Facebook? Role of what? What role of the state? Like among society, should it be more utilitarian, like what you suggested, or should it be more regulatory, or should it be a company? Well, the, the state, you mean the government? However you define the state. <laughs> I mean, I think this comes, this comes down to the, our, our political system is fucked. Uh, sorry, but our government sucks. And the entire system is broken. And the concept of money is totally 
screwed up. And the idea that our lives are spent working so we can then buy something and get a mortgage and then we can raise our kids and send them to university and take out loans or and then have interest and then work all of it and then retire at 70 or 60 or 80 is bullshit. And so I think the entire system at large is totally broken, whether it's the government and cultural. I mean, this is like very liberal perspective, but I think, you know, these these institutions that we've developed in the last century or two, you know, are broken. And so I think it's a much bigger question, I think, that I can answer. Um, but I think this, the stuff that's happening in here is just like Coca-Cola and just like Chevron and just like these large corporations that are now becoming global. And, we, and we're saying, yeah, I'm on, I'm, you know, like Facebook is like saying, yeah, Chevron, you know, like, yeah, oil company or yeah, you know, uh, Nestle or whatever, big, like, you know, big global brands. Twitter, it's like, it's like the modern uh, yeah, Nestle, I think, or something mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. So, Pepsi. So, I think, yeah. Can I jump in? Does that answer? Yes, it, please, Adrian. It's it just, uh, it was really interesting. I've got lots of different questions to ask, but um, one way you frame what your, what you see the problem is the addiction way. That's one way you're yeah. framing the problem. Other times it comes through, you talk about fight the machine, which is a kind of different framing. It's more conflictual. It's like, it's a bit more like, the kind of matrix scenario where you have, yeah. you know, you're stripping away the kind of the really shiny, dazzling kind of immersion in the experience and saying, no, there's another grittier reality that we have to kind of recognize and contest. The addiction one is kind of, um, is I think the one that pervades most of what you say, all the talk about dopamines and oxytocin and all that stuff is kind of coming out of an addiction understanding. And um, there's a lot of, I guess, 20th century, there's a lot of addiction talk because the models of addiction that came out around alcohol and cigarettes and then kind of narcotics and all that stuff have been incredibly powerful in ways that governments have thought about social problems. Mm. Um, and they continue to be really powerful ways. They tend to lead to regulation in a way. Addiction, once you call something an addiction, then addictions need to be treated and you have to set up institutions to do treatments and whether they're medical institutions or kind of social institutions they, they tend to kind of intervene in people's lives in an institutional way. So, yeah, this is a kind of really open question about what, what's at stake in framing it as an addiction? And, I mean, then if you put that in a slightly more broad historical context, um, you could say that kind of every media formation we've come through has, in a way, had these ways of captivating us, like, you know, novels, films. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned writing yourself. Um, you could say that every media formation is, in a sense, a kind of a way of capturing our, our perceptual fields and, oh, what's that phrase you use? Getting us to take out tabs, I like that, and take tabs out on things, whether it's in you know, the word, the image, or whatever. So would we want to say that all media systems have been addictive systems? Mm. And in that case, what you're doing at Camp Grounded becomes a question of, is it just a choice? At Camp Grounded, there's some, probably some media-style activities. I know you do making stuff as well. Mm -hmm. But there is some kind of media-related activities there too. Yeah. And then the question is, you know, is it about kind of having multiple addictions rather than single addictions, or are there alternative ways of talking, which aren't addiction-based? Is the conflictual one a good one, or are there other are there other ways of kind of telling the story that aren't addiction? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm a little bit troubled by the addiction one. I think it it taps into the power of the engagement of the of the media. It gets you this sense of it's really embodied. It's kind of beneath the level of consciousness often. It's happening faster than you can keep up with. But on the other hand, it does bring with, with it this big baggage of intervention, and particular kind of medical, political styles of intervention, mm. sometimes quite harsh in relation to, say, drugs, which, you know, there's been forced treatments and all that stuff. Mm. Well, you said a lot there. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I think, it's no, that's great. I think, so to step on, or to try to get on kind of one thing you said, which was about books, or... Throughout mm. human history, there's been different things that have come through. Mm. So the book, if someone spends their entire adolescence or even at all just reading, yeah. I mean, again, is it, if they're, there's the question of if you're hurting other people, because there's a lot of addicts who, who are functional addicts who never seek help because they don't need to. Mm. You know, if you're video gaming at home all day, it's one thing, but it's when you're doing things that become, that put other people at harm, mm. right? So that's kind of where I, where I really... Letting people know that if you feel addicted, it's because these things are created in this way. And if you're doing stuff that's 
taking away from your life or se- I talk about separating from you fam- from your family or from your community or from your, your friends there's a lot that's the kind of the addiction part of it but I think so the book if someone's always reading their entire life and they're ignoring their family or their kids or their they don't go to work because they're reading or they're if the, if the, if the book itself became this thing mm-hmm. someone would have to say okay put the book down you know someone would family friends or if, or if it needed something but the book isn't designed in a way that it has this feedback loop you know the the written word. You know you finish it. There's not there's not a notification. There's not something within there. You can't put something in the book. It's so very, it's it's a very one way experience, right? Um, I was talking to a woman from Blair Partnerships, which is J.K. Rowling's publishing company, this week about this, and we started getting this heated debate. And I said, well, if someone really just spent their entire life reading a book, what does that mean? Mm. But but are they harming other people? And mm. um, so, and I think when the book first came out, there was pictures of people and there was th- people, everyone reading, and people were saying, "What are we doing?" You know. Yeah. And I think it's, and I think you know, anytime a new technology comes out, book, recorded audio, anything that people start questioning what it's doing to storytelling or to the ability to remember. Um, but I think the interesting thing about technology is that it is something that that we don't understand the long-term implications of what it's doing to our psychology and what it's doing to our brains, and because we're becoming such an uh, habituated, if you want to say addicted, I think there's some some question of just the unknown, and then also of like what people do because they become addicted to this device. But I I, I guess the question of 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 the government's place or pol- politics or law legal, you know, I'll give you some personal stuff. My brother is a uh, was was in, is in recovery. He's he was on opiates, and he almost killed himself. And the only reason why he didn't kill himself is because my parents found him in a state. And got him help, and now he's coming out of being in recovery. Um, but the the government has nothing to do with them with it. With it, he could have killed himself. The go- you know he he almost killed himself, and the government um, doesn't have anything to do with it. And there's a private program he went to, and now he's two years in recovery. And we and we connect with him, and he you know he sees us drink, and and but we don't have the same kind of um, innate uh, kind of problem to to substance like he does. Um, and so I think with tech addiction or things like this, when they start being called that even at a larger level, I think, you know, it's up to you and it's up to your friends and family until you hurt someone. You know, until you hurt someone. But then it's like, at what point is it that Adam is his wife or, or your husband or your friends or someone in your family is on the road and something happens or when someone, when, I don't know, I think this is, a, the addiction is a very interesting conversation because it's, mm-hmm. it's, addiction is never a problem until someone gets hurt. You know, until something happens. There's suicides in America with people who spend too much time online. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the kid who, who used to work at Facebook, one of the founders of Facebook, uh, left to start this thing called Diaspora. He, he committed suicide two years ago because he couldn't. Um, in Las Vegas, Tony Shea, who started Zappos, recently started this utopia in, in Las Vegas to start the new tech boom. And he's had seven suicides this year from his developers because they feel overwhelmed and overworked. So, this is a question to ask about the, the addiction part of it is, you know, what happens when people start feeling really lonely and people start feeling really sad and people start the escaping? Mm-hmm. What does that do? And people start feeling, unha- I mean, this is the larger question of the unknown. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, I agree with you. I think, historically, it's da- it can be a dangerous thing. And I think people need to know that, you know, you go to Facebook's office and they used to have the word dopamine in the, up on some of the whiteboards. Really? Yeah. There's this, I mean, it's, it's kind of a fable now, but they used yeah. to have the word dopamine on the office. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. it's great questions. I don't yeah. know. Right. But people always ask me, would it, be bad if every, would it be bad if everyone on the subway or everyone on the bus was looking at a book all the time? Mm-hmm. Come on, they're reading. I'm like, yeah, it would be. Mm-hmm. Like, I think, but that's me defining my morals on everybody else. Um, but if a bus driver was also reading the book while he's driving, then... Mm-hmm. Do others have questions about addiction? <laughs> Um, because that was one of the key blog posts that we read for today. How does Laura Portward Stacer uh, describe the discourse of addiction around new technology? Right. And I think that what Adrian was getting at was trying to say, what do you, what do you, Levi? What do you get? He's saying, Levi, what do you get about framing it in the discourse of addiction? Maybe that's not the right, the best way to frame it to achieve the goal you want to achieve. And what the author was is saying, I think she's trying to say that. When you pathologize something mm. and use the discourse of 
medicalization or, or, or medicine, you, you, patho you say there's a sick level of consumption and there's a normal level of consumption, not taking into account the idea that maybe there should be a no consumption, right? So the problem is that you well, normalize, you normalize, you consumption normalize a certain level of consumption, which may not be what you necessarily want to do. I mean, I hear you saying things like you'd like to see people have the option of getting off, but by utilizing the discourse of addiction, you say there's a pathological level, there's a normal level, because right? well, I mean, you normalize, I, because you naturalize but, a certain degree of social media use. Why can't we have the option of, of opting out entirely from these systems? But I know of capture and consumption. But I know people who don't use it at all. I know people who don't use social media and they're totally happy. I know people who use just a little bit. Our friend Joe. Mm -hmm. Never barely updates it, but he uses it when he's traveling to find people in the areas, and he uses it very. So some people are really good at not having to use it all the time. They they're predisposed to not. And then people like myself and like people in this room, like we're predisposed to to want it more. Maybe because we were an earlier digital native, or we spent more of our lives on it. But I think what proportion of people don't use any social media? What are the figures on that? I don't know. Yeah. I don't have that. I think it depends on how you define it. Yeah, I mean, what is social? Well, but with the list of platforms that you find on Wikipedia under like social media, I mean, three hundred of them. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the majority of people on Facebook. The majority of the population so. is on Facebook, but um, yeah, as in they did sign up once. They signed up, but for some reason or other. Yeah, yeah I don't have that. What data. half a, maybe half a million people on Sinu Weibo or. Half a million. I don't half know. A I have a billion. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, like, so you could begin to put together a number on the global population from that. It's yeah. very hard to say that how they what they actually use because um, I signed up once, but I don't go to Facebook, yeah, so yeah. I'm there in the figures. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I think that would be a great yeah. thing to yeah. try yeah. to figure out. Yeah, I Could someone do that during the race? <laughs> 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 Real <laughs> figures. Yeah. Yeah. I th and if yeah, I, I and I to be honest. This is the larger question of whether it's the machine or the systems which yeah. we live is like, is like, should we be consuming? Like, is it make us happier, which is a harder thing, or does it make, which, which can in many ways kind of be calculated, but does it improve our lives? Like, are we going in a direction as humans where our lives are actually being improved by any of this? I think that's the question. Like, are we healthier? Are we happier? Are we more connected by all this shit? Or, is, or are we going to look back in 100 years and, and say, the people would look back and be like, remember when they spent all their time on social media? Like, that was ridiculous. <laughs> or in 2,000 years, they'll say, there was this point in humanity where everyone decided to share everything all the time and spend their life on the screens. And then the comet hit, and they couldn't get the systems back up, so they just stopped. <laughs> and they started farming again. And then they lived happily ever after. You know? <laughs> Can I talk about cultural differences? Yeah. Because um, in the West, like in the US and UK, you have been well developed and the... Um, the capital for income was higher. So you have been bored with all those and you find that it, it's something addition for digital. But for Asia, particularly for Malaysia, we are just growing and most likely we are only using Facebook for around four or five years. So what do you think about uh, how is it to say that it's a global culture that media has to be refused? Because for other countries, we are just starting to use technology and what do you think about it? So I, I think, I think again, I never say media refusal. I never say stop using it. I never say don't use it at all. I say find a way. I, the language is hard because it's not balanced. It's not integrated. We're trying to find a word. But find a way that it's like improving your life where the tools are helping you stay more connected, but they're not getting in the way of you. So I think... Being in a company like Malaysia or some new company, new I mean, country like Malaysia, a company country like Malaysia, that's coming, that's that's now having more technology. It's like as you're using them and as they're integrating into life, figuring out how to do that well. And I think unplugging. I always say unplugging is just a really great way to get perspective. If you're in a relationship with a boy or a girl or partner and you guys are fighting all the time, like one of the best ways to get perspective is to go take a break for a week and then come back and see what's working and what's not working. So I think, even if you're, like my girlfriend, I have, we've been together six years, but we still kind of take time to give each other space to still feel like, who am I when I'm with this person? So it's like with the device, who am I when I'm always using it? Who am I when I'm not? And how do I kind of find the symbiotic relationship? When I was living in Cambodia, they got uh, some of the um, telephone lines while I was there. And there's, there was two women who were sisters who lived on the island um, 
who got cell phones while we were there. I remember this. And I remember them seeing, walking on the beach, like, I don't know, maybe 50 meters apart, and they'd be talking to each other sometimes. And it was just like, and I wasn't judging them, but I was thinking, like, you know, they only have 20 contacts in their phone, but they're always on their phone now. And what does this look like for them to, like, being introduced to a cell phone on an island with only the few islands having connectivity to now spend, like, she was always on her phone talking, I don't know who, but it started making me think as, again, this shiny device, this medium is becoming so fascinating that when she goes home at night and they're all in their own space, like, what does that look like? I don't know. Maybe just to share that because um, I find unplugging is not, uh, it might be useful for those countries who are now developing because like some places in Malaysia doesn't actually have good uh, access to internet. So it might be like, I don't know, like a, a lower or a not that developed country mm. is a better place to stay because you can't have access to internet at all. You don't even have the facilities to go online, so you can't say that you have been addicted or been to the... Because I have an experience, because when I stay in the capital, I have all the 3Gs and 4Gs, and then I have Wi-Fi. Then when I move a year ago to a place more rural, there's no connection at all. So I have to like climb up to the higher level to get the connection, then I say, okay, just forget about it. And how does that feel? Um... <laughs> No, because I, I got different things happening because um, Asian students might look into you and say that why you're not responding to my emails. That's an yeah. academic I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. So I have students who send me emails just at midnight, 12, and they want to see you at 8 o'clock in the morning. And if, you re- <laughs> and if you don't respond to them, then they will like say, why are you not responding? And so I, I think that is a, I mean, that is the example, though. It's like... I'm so important. Read my article at one in the morning because life is about me, 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 me. You know, like that's like that. You know, I think that is a symbol of a culture, like the scary parts of the the technology culture of someone sending you something and having you have to read it by your eight a.m. meeting. What about your life? With the smartphone, my life is with the smartphone. Every day with flying students come in. They like to ask you questions, particularly before their deadlines or exams, and. Um, I also have another concern is I don't introduce gadget to my kids. I got um, mm. 10 year old and 8 year old kids. But because of peer pressure and peer awareness, when I'm away, they took my iPad and play and they just hear me coming and then they just put back. <laughs> so it's like I'm feeling that I, I don't introduce technology to them. But they have the peers who have been using technology and gadget and they are asking why am I not letting them use it. So they will then steal it or they were trying to see that when I whenever I go away they will take my I they will take yeah. my smartphone and the iPad and they play on it and then after that they hear me coming and they just put back and say nothing's going on. Yeah it's I mean it's <laughs> interesting. Like I in America we have the one laptop per child program or whatever. And I and I talk about what would it look like when these kids get a laptop at a young age to create a, a mindfulness program or something that says like, you know, here's the let's not call it addiction, but here's the biochemical Here's what's going on in your brain when you use technology. You're put in the fight or flight. You're not. You can't use both your, you know, both sides of your brain at the same time. So when you're using one kind of platform, it puts you in this. I mean, just to educate the kids about when you look at a screen before you go to bed, this is what it's going to do to your dreams. And if we had an education program or curriculum developed that was just like, uh, just like uh, a, a real sex ed system. You know, there's sex education that's bullshit, but there's sex ed that actually informs people of what happens and then maybe about smoking and drinking and, you know, a proper education program around this so then kids knew why you didn't want them to use their devices, you know? I would say that it's a cultural difference because we are not in the process of getting yeah. the technology. So, yeah. like, a lot of nurseries which introducing iPad for children aged 3 to 4 years old, there's a lot of response coming from the parents. Everyone will register and say, oh, they have iPad for... The nurseries doing that? Yes. The 3 year olds the, the preschools, yeah, the 3 to 5, and they take that... The playtime is to play on the iPad and everything. Oh, Learning via iPad. Oh and well, and some, something to what you said earlier is I'll point. So so let's let's look at the Silicon Valley or San Francisco as this um, this window into where Malaysia or someone else might be going. Yeah. So in San Francisco on Mission Street, which is like the hip place where you have to have a nice bicycle and a beard and you know everyone, <laughs> you know I'm just giving you kind of this exaggerated like this American thing where the rent has gone up 300 percent in the last two years because 
everyone makes money from tech companies and it's this gentrified region where everyone you know is basically working for tech or, or as an artisan and something but this strip on the mission and everywhere around it most of the cafes have signs that say no Wi-Fi and they say no laptops anymore okay. and so yes yeah, so there's this uh, this surgence of people reclaiming community space and reclaiming public spaces to have connection and to not be inundated by the tech and not be inundated by their tools. So, so it's partly about people on tables for like six hours with an yeah. online copy. Yeah. Well, yeah. It ruins their business model. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's well it's the same issue. But in, but in San Francisco, some of these places, it's purely out of, of not wanting their space to be an office, but it's yeah. a place for connection. And yes. um, I actually had a guy who has a cafe in Oakland where I live. And he just wrote me and said he does things on a table that say, um, it says like analog zone, after 5 p.m., please don't, we don't use computers in, the, in this place and we just, whatever. And he says, when I left, we were talking, no one regards this. And he just wrote me an email yesterday saying, as of January 1st, he wants to make it in the Wi-Fi, no Wi-Fi in his, in his cafe. And he wants to talk to me about how we can do a panel and talk about why. Yeah, sure. So I think this is a little glimpse into and so it's always the haves and the haves nots. Yeah. You know, we always want what we don't have, and then once you have it, you're seeking for the other, the grasses. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hear from others. I wanted to go at him. You do? Of, speaking of work, like, it's 20 to 6. How long do you keep going? I thought we, I thought we went to 6. No, do you? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go, sorry. You do? Okay. I'm going to some food. All right. Sorry. Very good. Sorry, do, you, do you have another question? One more? You want One to more, in? bring it. Uh, <laughs> not really. No, okay. I mean, you know, it costs lots more. <laughs> Look at these notes. Yeah, I want, want to know what's in your yeah. brain. These are not questions, they're just my <laughs> thoughts about stuff. Um, and I like using a pen. But no, no, I'll leave it because I can see there's plenty of discussion. Excellent. Here. Some Something I would share quickly, I share a lot, obviously. I mean, <laughs> I'm on the same stuff, but is that like, when you write with a pen, um, so. When you take notes on your computer or on a screen, you're pushing buttons, and so you're not making symbols, and so you're not encoding what you're putting out into your uh, short term, into your working, and into your long term memory. So when you take notes on a computer or on a pad, you likely won't remember it. When you write it, you're creating symbols, and the creation of symbols is how we created the written language. So we've evolved when we to write that we actually remember what we write. So even if you don't look back at the writing, you remember it. So this is just straight up developmental. Uh, Absolutely. And this is from a guy who never took a note when in his entire four years as an undergraduate. He just sat there and listened and meditated. <laughs> but this is, but it's, yes. This Absolutely. Is, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Adrian. Don't no worry. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I want, I want to see your notes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll put them on Instagram. I'll scan them and put them on Instagram. Perfect. <laughs> well, I don't have an Instagram, so. Okay. Facebook. Whatever. Yeah, Facebook. Drive okay. safely. Take care. Yeah. See you later, everyone. Yeah. So we've got, we've only probably got 10 more minutes, I guess. Um, so let's just, let's just all pose a simple question and get out of here. What do you think? What do you, what do you got going on? You are, you are a user, a high tech user, habitual user, no? <laughs> okay. Daphne, what have you written down for a question? Some social networking now has changed our way to get our information. Mm -hmm. So, do you think this social network will replace some traditional journalism, just like the newspaper, television? Because we sometimes you get the first hand information from our friends. They post their news, their experience on the Facebook. We can get very detailed news from them rather than a newspaper. They are too late. So we just see one day they will replace the journalism. I mean, we're already seeing the digital. Great question. I mean, digital is replacing print in many ways. But journalism is so hard to define because everyone becomes a citizen journalist now. And we're all creating content and sharing. And I, I don't know. I mean, Adam could talk about this, but I think that what is like it's just what is true. You know, any people are fr I have friends who post and repost, and you see things go live, and it's like, okay, what is really true? Um, and even with conventional media newspapers, you never know what's true. But online, it's so hard to know 
what's factual based and what's propaganda and what, what video, like, I was, my mom sent me a video about what's going on in the Middle East, in Israel. She sent me one video, my friend said something else about Palestine and about the West Bank. And then both videos were using content from 10 years ago, reproduced with over voiceovers and it was totally fake. And both of them were propaganda to put at the other side. And so, that, and those videos all had, you know, 8 million views and had been shared on Facebook and there was, and then it was propagating Facebook with people having anti-Semitic and anti-Palestinian rhetoric. And so the question I think is, is yes, the answer is yes, it will take over, but how will we as a society know what real news is? How can we know what's, what's legitimate? Absolutely. That's, this, that's the interesting and yes. scary piece. Absolutely. Absolutely. We talked about that yesterday in the other class. <laughs> Didn't we? Yeah. Uh, we others, let's just go around the room and finish them up. Questions? Read the article, but um, one of the uh, arguments was that what you recommend is uh, some kind of uh, aesthetic preferences. Like, for example, okay, I quit uh, Facebook and I go to galleries to uh, um, uh, watch fine art. So it's a difference. So how do you hierarchize these two? Why, if I spend my time on Facebook, it's um, uh, it's not as good as if I spend my time in a uh, gallery, in, for example, uh, you know, watch um, uh, works of a famous artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's. I mean, there's a ton of reasons with the light and just mm -hmm. looking at a screen and your eyes and your depth perception and there's tons of just right. basic science um, on a so social. I think what he's addressed on a social address is taste, right? Taste and class. Yeah, taste. And the arbitrary yeah. nature by which we yeah. say that Facebook is is low class and tacky and cheesy, yet going to a gallery and looking at some yeah. fine artist is, but is I, something that's worth celebrating, right? And we. But I wouldn't. Postmodern theory has completely debunked that arbitrary differentiation. Yeah, I mean, I, and I wouldn't agree with that statement, that going to a gallery is better than Facebook. I would say experiencing things firsthand is better than Facebook. Why is nature better? Everything is nature. I know, but you really, you <laughs> reify and celebrate nature, like Henry David Thoreau, you quote often, and you put him in your book, and you have them out in the redwood forest. Well, Why is nature so wonderful? I mean, if I have to answer that for someone, then... You know, you know I'm a total hippie, and I love to camp and do all no, but, that stuff. But, but this is when I tell people, they say, why is being in nature better than being in London? And some people like being in the city better. It's a good, good, good for them and good riddance in many ways. But I think that, well, again, it's, it's you, you incredible health benefits from being in nature. Um, a sense of of identity on a much bigger picture. Like you look at trees that are 2,000 years old who are giving you oxygen, who are destroying because of the, the fog layers have changed. This is a California thing. But when you're around trees and rivers and nature, it changes your perception of who you are and the perspective that you have. When you look at the stars and there's full sky of stars and you're worrying about something and then you look up at the sky and you're like, <laughs> like, you know, it gives perspective. Fresh air provides, you know, um, fresh, for fresh air is great and, and there's also something that trees give off called phytanocides which organic compound which help your immune system but also just being barefoot in nature is like in many ways also also it's um, it puts you at the opposite of fight or flight because it puts you in a relaxed state of mind when you're looking at trees this is what uh, Paul M no, um, Professor Berman from Michigan found that when people are looking at trees versus looking at cityscapes, they're put into a state of relaxation which helps them remember more um, because they're not, they're not fearful of a car or a bike or something because we know that we can be in nature now and there's not going to be an animal for attacking us for the most part because we're, so we feel safe in nature. There's all these different reasons. For me, I like being in nature because um, it feels good. And like you can't, you know, it, I, I'm not lying to myself when I say it feels good to have my bare foot in the dirt under some trees. And some people, it feels better to be on Facebook and to be isolated um, and be in their bedroom. So for me, I, those people can continue doing that. All right, I got it. That's their... 
share anything? But, but great no, question. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, in, uh, this is not but he said that um, people with various means they fall the way that they want to develop and trans transform themselves to attain a more certain thing, uh, who they're being. But I think um, in his blog, he seems saying that um, the action to refuse media is always the upper class people. Because um, he said that the, the tape is a reflection of social classes. So what about the lower mid middle class people? Are they? I don't know if I agree with that. Well, I mean. I just don't know if I agree with that argument. Well, think about this. Like, think about how cool it was when we all said, oh, we don't watch TV. And how that was a marker of a certain kind of elite cultural <laughs> status, right? You're, you become educated. You know, you've got other things to do. You like to go to the gallery. You go to nature. You don't have a TV. You're so cool. You're over that. That's the new I've gotten off Facebook has become the new I've gotten off TV, right? Because I have better things to do, right? And so it's inherently an elitist position, right? Because only certain people can do it. And you've heard all of the students ask, you know, pose that question. So it's something yeah, well, that is certainly there. Well, I think they're posing because they've read it. <laughs> well, no, but it's a, so, it's, it's, it's a sociological concern is really yeah. how the... the the, the services you offer are particularly well suited for a particularly well financially equipped human being. I mean, I think, I think that I, I would disagree with the argument he's the author's making that, like, I think that coming to my camp or retreat is something because you're putting a financial dollar out. Mm -hmm. But I think the ability to not watch media is I, I wouldn't say it's a class issue. I would say it's a class issue because people aren't, maybe the classes aren't educated to realize that, just like television, it's bullshit. You know, like, most of the media, the Fox, the TV, the news we're reading is all twisted around an agenda of some sort, and maybe a lower class aren't educated to realize that. Um, and that's why they're not watching it. You know, they're believing it, or they're mm -hmm. watching television because it's great for them, but not realizing that television is being produced because then they sell advertising around it, and those stories help make money for... Uh, Mm -hmm. Huge, huge companies. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's the dis discourse. But I think it's the argument of coming to my camps or retreats. Um, a, they're not that expensive, mm -hmm. you know. And B, we do offer scholarships, you know. So I, and yeah. and C, our like ours is just a small a small offering, you know. Like I'm not trying to say, like people ask me, I can't afford to go. And I'm like, go camping with your friends, like do that. Yeah, but the knowledge that organic food is good, the knowledge that media fasts can be good for you, resides in a certain kind of knowledge community, a knowledge class yeah. of people, which is inflected and intersected by class and gender, education, finance, right? Yeah, I mean, it's... Right? So they don't even have access to that knowledge that they need to get off the media. The people that have access to the... Knowledge of the yeah, which is media. which is exactly why I say there should be an education system, exactly. yeah. like no, the reform. That. I love that. You know, it's like parents should know. They should, like, I, I, I like that part. I think take it to the streets. Marxist Matthew, let's hear it, brother. Mine's on media asceticism. So if an individual were to say, "I have an addiction to social media," and this condition, um, in a wider perspective, has been. Um, Apologize. I need to go on a detox and fast. So a lot of the um, words associated are have religious connotations, like Sabbaths and mm. fasting. Mm -hmm. um, but how long would be enough to see the benefits um, in the long term? Yeah. So NASA, uh, NASA did a study, but also the Navy did a study. The U.S. Navy did a study where they took people off for five or six days, and they found it takes about four to five days for blood pressure and heart rate and habits to kind of start not going away, but to become mindful of them and become aware. I think fasting, uh, I think fasting or digital detox by nature, any of these things, is just giving someone the perspective to, to, to become aware of, of what habits they have and, and, and what it feels like and get back to a more neutral level. I think it's about the integration. I think if someone fasts and unplugs and then they get back to their own life, they're screwed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, 
you're not setting anyone for success. It's the same problem with diets. Diets are shit. Like, if you're going on a diet to lose weight, you will gain your weight back. But if you change your diet, like, meaning if you change and balance your diet, you start eating healthier instead of taking things away, then you'll be healthier for longer and you won't, your weight might not fluctuate. So I think this idea of fasting, even the name digital detox is, I'm not interested in it anymore as much. You know, it's good because I think you have to unplug. It's a begin, we're in the beginning of a large conversation, but first step is unplug then awareness, then mindfulness, and then reemerge and what the integration process looks like, which you need community, you need friends, you need accountability. Like sometimes I do at conferences, I say, okay, everyone, you know, we do this test, we have a big conversation at the end, I say, okay, look to the person to your right and say one thing if you want to change about your habits. We did this yesterday in class with undergraduates. But like, but like look at one habit, we didn't do, but like, and then give the person your phone number and tomorrow call them and just see, and if you have accountability, then you can start shifting your awesome. habits. But, yeah, but good like, question. And also, I like how you identified the, the discourse of religion and spirituality. Yeah. Because that is something that's pe peculiar and unique and kind of cultic, cultish. And I know where a lot of this stuff is coming from, right? From this kind of eco-spirituality, this burning man religiosity, yeah. right? I mean, are you comfortable with, like, having all of these signs and symbols of spirituality be associated with it? Wouldn't it be cleaner if we just relied upon the medical discourse and the discourse of addiction or the discourse of politics and regulation? Why do you want to add this, this spiritual overtone to it all the time? I mean, know? I don't think I add it all the time, but I think by nature, by my, I mean, I'm a human, and so I'm putting out this information and I have my views and my own lens and my own perspective, and I have my own story that I've carried with me. You know, I come from a background, and so that comes out. Um, and I don't think, I don't think that we, whether it's spirituality or whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to call the thing that makes you you, whether it's and whatever you believe in a, a source or not having a source, or whether you believe in a god or no god, we can all identify with taking a big breath in, and taking a big breath out. <laughs> And being super grateful that we have that breath. Because if that breath didn't exist, we'd be screwed. And so I think that for me is like, That's argument whatever you want to call that thing, yeah. I think that, that inspires, like many ways, you can, like, you can think of that as being the detox. You know, like every, every time you breathe out, you're detoxing. You're breathing in carbon and you're exhaling. I'm breathing, in breathing in oxygen, exhaling carbon. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking, but uh, but you know what I'm saying. So I think the detox is just part of the conversation, and the spiritual connotations might be convoluted for some people. But that's why I don't talk about Sabbaths and I don't talk about mm. fasting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although it's probably good to fast every once in a while. It's probably good to take a week off or a day off of work every once in a while. Definitely. Katie, come on, Katie. I'm here for you. Have you have any evaluation on the effectiveness of it after they go back to their yeah. normal life? Yeah. What, what do you do? I mean, I'll try to keep this short, but I've been really bad at giving people something to do. People go home and they like, they're like, ah, and they want to make changes. Or they were inspired, or maybe they didn't have a big problem with technology, but they, a lot of people come to camp and tech piece is not even part of it. People return to life and say, so at camp, there's no locks. You carry your bag and you leave your bag and you run away and you come back and your back is still there. You know, you, you get a drink and you share. It feels like a utopia. You know, feel everyone is sharing the sharing economy. Everyone is sharing. Everyone is giving. Everyone is gifting. Everyone is looking after each other for the most part because we're all in it together. So I think people go back and just see, look at society and say, why aren't we living more like that? So people go home and or they want to make changes in technology. And so we haven't been very good at saying, here's how to do it because I don't know how to do it. But this year, I'm thinking more about, okay, how do we facilitate these people to, to continue acting in this way or feeling inspired to continue the conversation or to organize in their communities some way to keep the conversation going? Um, but, yeah, in many ways, we send people off, mm -hmm. and then they're, like, the worst, you know, later. But now they're aware of it, so they're worse, and now they've pathologized it. And so, yeah, it can be very, a very challenging thing, and I feel a need to help people go back. Yeah. I was just thinking after four days then, what happened after that? 
I mean, it's just it's just like let's say you you tell everyone, or it's like giving people like a small taste of what's possible. You know, the digital detox is just a part of it, but like the food at camp is healthy. Everyone like mm-hmm. everyone is a, more, all the staff are available for you. People become available for each other. You can walk by someone and say like, "Hey, how you doing?" And it's like, and people are high fiving and what you know, just it feels like the ideal utopian society. And so, I think it's mm-hmm. you know what happens when they go back from that. They just got a taste of it, and maybe they say, "I'm going to quit my job," or maybe they say. You know, I, I, my wife or my boyfriend or my husband isn't a good match for me because I realize I feel more free. Maybe there's, there's all these things that come. Mm-hmm. But for me, that's up to the individual. It's fine. It's just a taste. Absolutely. Thank you, Levi, <laughs> Thank you for guys. coming and hanging out. It's been really fun, really educational. Thanks. Let's Thanks. go.